Hi, uh, welcome to the show. I'm joined by Phil Sturgeon. We're going to be speaking about rapid prototyping and the role that open source can play. How are you doing? Hey, not bad. Thanks for having me on the show. No worries. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about you and uh, the stuff that you're getting up to just now? Sure. Um, I'm a predominant predominantly a PHP developer, always hard to say that word. Um, I've, uh, I'm the founder of Pyro CMS, and more recently I've been working as a lead engineer for a startup called Capture uh, over, in, over in New York. Right, so how did, they, how did Capture um, get in contact with you? Um, it actually worked out pretty well. Um, a, they tried hiring a mutual friend of mine. Um, he'd just taken on a new job, and uh, they, he kind of sent them my way, um, which was a nice little surprise. I got a message through at 2, 2 a.m. on Facebook saying, hey, buddy, do you want to work in New York? That's <laughs> <laughs> a pretty good conversation to have that. Yeah. So would you say that it was like based on your reputation in the community that they, they found you then? Uh, it pretty much was. I mean, the um, the ego egotistical side would like to think that I'd be headhunted directly but the more the more realistic way these things work is that um, you know people are always trying to find people and, and word of mouth is usually the best way of getting it done so um, I've been lucky to make quite a few friends all over the place in the coding light community and PHP in general so um, when they were trying to find a job and they got in touch with him he knew that I would be up for up for the job so making making as many developer friends all over the place as you can definitely helps with uh, with opportunities like that oh, yeah. Yeah, that's really good. So we're speaking about open source software and rapidly creating a prototype after you've tested the market for your idea. So with Capture, what open source software does uh, Capture use? Um, we use Laravel 4 at the moment. Um, before that, we were using Fuel PHP, but uh, we're kind of replacing that now. Um, we use quite a lot of PSR composer packages, all PHP stuff. Um, we have... Uh, uh, OAuth 2 server built by Alex Bilby who conveniently is sat right there um, <laughs> and we have um, what else do we use uh, a few packages, one called Datum which is uh, a nice PHP date handling system um, and Sentry 2 which is a generic authentication package for PHP Alright, great so uh, tell us about Pyro CMS uh, so Pyro CMS is a content management system, very basic. You can um, you can equate it to WordPress if you like um, from a usage point of view. Um, it's built with Code Igniter, but we're slowly moving across to Laravel, uh, mostly because of the, the the slow pace of development in the in the Code Igniter community. Um, it's a free, completely open source uh, system with a professional uh, flavor, if you will, uh, which is ninety bucks, and you get the multi-site manager. Um, what else? You can you can uh, white label the back end, so you can remove the logos and whatnot for your clients and um, streams. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm a bit slow today. <laughs> Took a very long grey, uh, very long coach to get up to Newcastle yesterday, and I'm rather 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 slow. Yeah, so you get streams, which is a pretty powerful uh, con custom data management system. Um, so mouthful. Like. It is, yeah. Yes. So many words. <laughs> so you've been writing a, a book, catapult. Catapult into Pyro CMS is meant to be the first of a two or three part series. The first part is um, uh, mostly a, a, an introduction to the content management system. Um, some of the terminology we use, some of the, we try not to use jargon and we don't like to have like widgets and stuff, but ironically we do have widgets. So um, there are terms that you'll need to, to learn and understand and this kind of walks you through and gets you building a custom theme, which is one of the smallest chapters there because themes are really easy to make. Um, and we kind of walk you through module development. Now it's trying not to replace the user guide or be like a rewording of the user guide, but user guide is meant to be, you can look at any one page by itself and it will make sense to you. Whereas with a book, it's good to like take a user actually on a kind of walk or a story through from, from knowing nothing to, to knowing something. So you know what level they're at instead of just kind of drop in links and drop in replacements. I've used Pyro a few times now. And uh, I find it's it's pretty useful, and I was about to redo the the hatch website, but I just just didn't have time. <laughs> there but, you go. But uh, I was looking at the themes, and uh, I couldn't find any themes for it really. Um, is is that something you maybe look look about going into? Maybe creating a marketplace for Pyro CMS themes? Definitely. Um, themes are, are something that's kind of lacking from from the community at the moment, mostly because uh, historically we've always attracted mostly developers uh, to the community. So we've got a lot of PHP and Code Igniter developers that love developing with it, and they've slowly been kind of sneaking into their workplaces and and um, you know the, the developers kind of bring it into the company. But it's very hard, very rare that we find people um, making really nice 
resellable designs. So anyone can do this at the moment. They can put them on the store. They can they keep seventy percent. We we eat the PayPal fees uh, or Stripe fees and and keep a small percentage for ourselves. Um, but you keep seventy percent, and you can you know make as many themes as you like and t- turn over quite a tidy profit. Um, so if anyone's interested, listening to this, you know, get in touch. Yeah. <laughs> right. So bring us back to to open source. Um, you have a podcast where you speak about about PHP and open source PHP Town Hall. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so PHP Town Hall kind of started off. Um, anyone that, that's been following me on on the internet anywhere will know that I like to give my opinions about stuff, and I <laughs> I blog uh, quite a lot about you know sometimes giving tech guides and sometimes giving reviews or whatever, but quite a lot about opinions on stuff in PHP. Um, so I decided instead of just writing stuff, it might be fun to actually get a get a podcast going with with me and Ben Edmonds my co-host and every couple of weeks or whenever we feel like it we put uh, we just grab on we we take we field questions from the community and we try to find the best um, the best guest we can or the best guest or two to to answer those questions or to address a topic that's come up in the community so so recently at PHP uh, UK there was the whole issue of of whether the, the people from um, uh, the sponsors were being sexist by wearing the, you know, the, the, those various T-shirts and things like that. Um, we we got a few people on that would, you know, like to give an opinion on that topic and, and talked it through. Um, we also discussed like um, how mental uh, health issues can affect programming or how they can affect you working as a team, which are two pretty deep conversations. Usually, we just complain about how bad hosting is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. The one of the big um, questions that you've been speaking about is PHP's vision. Do you believe that PHP has a very good vision just now? I think that the group, the core development team is rather conflicted. There are some incredibly active, incredibly motivated um, individuals that are looking to, to, to make some very powerful and impressive changes to the language. There are some that don't want it to change at all, and there are some that don't really agree on how people are even using PHP itself. Um, so there's a lot of people that still prefer procedural coding over over OOP-based development, and there's a lot of developers that, even Rasmus, Rasmus himself, who don't use frameworks or anything else, which is, I'd say, a large percentage of the community. So, uh, because people can't even agree on how people are using PHP, they can't agree on what steps the language should take for itself. So, there's a bit of turmoil in the group over who's doing what or why, which is tricky. It is, it is tricky. So, open source, hmm. Composer and PSR is something you guys have been speaking a lot about. And uh, tell us a little bit about that. So... Composer and PSR often get bundled into the same group uh, because the two together are a powerful team. Um, Composer is a generic dependency management system. So you can use Composer without PSR and just send around your code, but it becomes much more powerful when used with PSR0, which is a auto-loading standard. This means you can take any code from any group and you can auto-load it in the same way. It's um, namespace, uh, vendor namespace, package namespace, class name, which is a very standard um, setup. Then if you use PSR1, you, uh, all of your method names and code from the outside will look the same, and it will avoid affecting anyone's code, so you don't randomly change the time zone halfway through a class, which I've seen done lots of times. Um, and PSR2 gives you a style guide to use in your project, um, where the, like, the, in- the actual innards of your code will look the same. Um, so those aren't really necessarily designed for the entire internet to use. They're mostly for the member projects of the PHP fig, but lots of people have started picking them up and, and being really happy about using them. Other people have started noticing them and thinking, why are they giving us these style guys? We don't want them. And that was never really the plan. So it's caused some confusion in the community, but it's, it's mainly intended for the, the member teams of the PHP fig and anybody else that feels like using them if they want to. I was trying to do something the other day with um, uh, distance management, uh, like are they close enough to this certain point based in feet, and I thought, oh god, I'm going to have to do maths again, aren't I? I don't want to have to do maths, and I just googled for geo tools, and three options came up. I grabbed the first one there, slung it into my code, and within five minutes I was perfectly um, calculating the curvature of the earth and doing all the code that I need to do with like three lines of the code. Yeah, That's exactly yeah, what Compose yeah. is all about. I don't want to have to learn or think or do stuff. I want to write... It's <laughs> probably a bit of an over-exaggeration, but I want to write code quickly, and I don't want to have to deal with all the n- niggly implementation details of, of you know, working out degrees and everything else. <laughs> Definitely. Well, that leads on great to, to this, this next question, then. If you're starting straight from scratch and you need to rapidly create a prototype of your idea, um, how would you go about it? Um, I generally don't like to recommend one specific framework for everything because there's always frameworks that are better at doing certain things. But recently I've been using Laravel 4 for quite a few different types of projects, API stuff, admin backend stuff, and nothing else. Um, 
I think it's a very uh, well-rounded player, and especially with the fact that Laravel 4 now has uh, built-in composer support, not only you can in, you know, use Composer easily, but you can all, all of the core is Composer itself. So when I'm building, uh, if I want to just slap something together, build you know, a prototype to show off base functionality, I will grab Laravel 4, grab a few Composer packages, throw in a few if statements, throw in Twitter Bootstrap, and that's pretty much all I need to do. Right? It's, it's incredibly easy to just smash in some code and, and get it working, and then hopefully you can build version 1 um, from scratch, as long as management don't try and coerce you into touting up the prototype a little bit. <laughs> it <laughs> which works, happens well, launch often. it, it works. <laughs> go, go, go. So uh, what stack would you use? Um, these days I'm mostly using uh, Nginx, just because it hands down beats Apache for everything I've done with it. Um, Nginx, PHP, um, when I'm building, uh, I try and use background jobs for, for a lot of the stuff as well, which is something that often gets overlooked in the PHP world. Um, and for those, I'm mostly using Python, just because it's nice and, and slick running on the command line. Um, and I try and avoid Mongo like the plague. There's such a like a trendy thing about using Mongo. If you want to talk to the guys at Mixcloud or Foursquare or anyone that's tried using Mongo as a persistent data storage for a growing website, it's great fun when you just start building it and then it goes downhill incredibly quickly. Just use Mongo for temporary data, stuff that if it, if it goes away, it doesn't matter. Um, anything you can rebuild on an hourly cron, for example, or anything you can dump into little areas might be great for Mongo, but don't be a, a Mongo. Mongo hipster. Don't just use Node for the sake of it. Don't just use Mongo for the sake of it. MySQL and Postgres and, and stuff like that, they work perfectly fine. They're not going to randomly explode. Um, so yeah, MySQL, Nginx, PHP, FPM, uh, Varnish, whenever you can, to just take off uh, the, the load from the server for anything static. Um, and, and Vagrant is a definite must for uh, developing locally, just so you know for a fact that your, your local environment is going to be the same as your production environment. Excellent. Well, that, that answers everything. Excellent. Thanks for speaking with me. All right. Thanks for having me. See you later, Phil.